for being here. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar. My name is Jason. Um, I work with AV Pro slash Meridio and the Imaging Science Foundation. And we wanted to put this webinar together to um, talk a little bit about some best practices that we're seeing in the world of calibration and in 2018. And, um, you know, as I was putting this together, I, I was really thinking about how, you know, as a calibrator, how much our role has changed in, in the past few years with, um, with everything revolving around HDR and, and 18 gig infrastructure and, um, you know, some of the challenges that we run into, um, you know, we're not just, you know, slapping a meter up on the screen and, and calibrating the TV anymore. We have to have a better under, understanding of the entire signal chain and get a little bit deeper into how HDMI works. And, and we want to make sure that all the components in the system behave and, and play nicely with each other. And, uh, you know, we, we, at the end of the day, we really want you to be able to give the best experience you can to your clients and customers. We, we have some tip, uh, tips and tricks that we'll show you on, um, you know, how to work with 18 gig high bandwidth HDR signals in existing systems that may have old, older infrastructure. I'll teach you some tricks on <clears throat> how to work with legacy components when it comes to HDR. And we'll get a little bit into calibrating HDR towards the end. So again, my name is Jason. I'm a lifelong AV enthusiast. Um, by the time I was 18 years old in 1999, I thought that, hey, I love this stuff so much, so why not try to get a job doing it? So in 1999, I started working in the AV space professionally. Um, you know, my, my path led me to ISF calibration in about 2008, and I haven't looked back since. I, I love this, this part of the field, and, um, you know, we get to play with some really cool TVs and see some really nice stuff. and um, you really get to test the limits of, of what some of these products can do. I'm um, a big mu music nerd and movie nerd, so um, I, I, I do enjoy watching movies um, the way they were intended, seeing things in the right color, seeing the right shadows, good skin tones, and, and all that good stuff. So um, I've started teaching the class in about 2012, and uh, you know, in about 10 years, I've calibrated around 4,000 or so displays. So um, I've got a lot of experience in this field, and uh, what's great about it, one of the things I love about it so much is that, you know, we're learning new new stuff every day. I mean, I'm still learning new stuff every day. So I'm going to walk you through this journey I've been on and, and try to help you, um, you know, any obstacles you run into in the field. Uh, I want to be able to help you get, get around some of this stuff. Uh, this session will be recorded, so if, uh, if you want to review later, that's not going to be a problem at all. Uh, we will end up posting um, posting the video up on YouTube so you can go back and review. There is a question box um, on your screen where you can ask questions. Um, I will try to answer those questions as we go. If I can't get to any of your questions, um, I can reach out to each one of you individually who asked the question, and I can answer it. Um, I can answer it uh, tomorrow at the latest. So, let's get started. All right. So, like I said before, the topics we're going to cover today is uh, things that we're facing uh, with calibration in 2018. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about 18 gig infrastructure and, and making sure that we're actually getting the correct signal to the display. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some tools that will make your life a little bit easier in doing some of this stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about how to actually calibrate the HDR signal. So how did we get here? Um, like I mentioned before, it, it, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was a lot different in the calibration world. Um, we were we were dealing with different tools. We were dealing with different displays, and uh, you know something that used to take a, a couple of hours can now take three or four hours. Maybe you're calibrating multiple modes for different room environments. Maybe you're calibrating for HDR and Dolby Vision and standard dynamic range on the TV. Um, so really, a lot has changed um, even in the past five years, uh, especially with the introduction of HDR, wide color gamuts, 4K resolution. Um, you know, there's there's all kinds of new stuff to learn, and if you'd taken if you'd taken an ISF course, say, five years ago and, and took one again now, it would be drastically different. So we'll take a little bit of, a little bit of a trip down memory lane here. A um, couple things that, that we really have to be careful with as calibrators when we're working on a system. And like I said before, it's not just about, um, it's not just about calibrating the TV and, and being done with it, being done with the display. Uh, we're, we're looking at this more as a system calibration these days. So a couple of things to check right off the bat. Uh, firmware updates are more critical than ever. If anybody remembers when the movie Avatar came out on 3D Blu-ray, it wouldn't play in half the Blu-ray players around the world until the Blu-ray players were updated for firmware. And we're starting to see that kind of stuff again. So just to make sure that the TV is behaving and uh, playing nice with the other components in the system, before you start the calibration job, 
make sure all of the firmware updates are done on each individual device. Um, calibrators have to really understand EDID. Um, it's something that we didn't really have to worry about too much before. Everything was 1080p. Everything was, uh, you know, everything was easy to work with with each other. But you know, we're getting to a position now where we have mixed systems, we have mixed resolutions and systems. So understanding EDID is critical. Um, we're building the system from ground up sometimes. So making sure the right components are used, the right cables are used, um, even down to things like matrix switches. Uh, we're gonna look at all that stuff. Every component in the system may need to be calibrated. Uh, what we mean by that is you have Blu-ray players, for example, that have their own calibration control. So things such as brightness and contrast in the Blu-ray player. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than calibrating the TV and spending all this time and you pop in your reference disc to check for shadow details and all your shadows are gone. Well, if the, cal if the TV's been calibrated correctly, then the culprit must be the Blu-ray player. So, you know, you have to understand that the Blu-ray player needs to be adjusted too, and you have to uh, remember to go into those Blu-ray player uh, settings and adjust those as well. Uh, we even see some video settings in receivers uh, in recent years too. So that brings up a whole other question. Where do you start? You know, if I've got a system that has a TV, cable box, Blu-ray player, and a receiver, then what do I calibrate first and what order do I go in? We'll talk about that a lot too. Um, calibrating one source to, cal to, to one calibrated TV. Again, the TV could be calibrated. You could have a, a good 4K HDR source. You just bought this beautiful 4K HDR TV, but if things aren't configured correctly, you will not get HDR and 4K to that television. How about more complex systems? You know, what if you do have a distributed system with matrix switches and extenders and things like that? Does all that stuff need to be checked too? Absolutely. So just a couple of examples of uh, simple versus complex systems. Uh, things that we're seeing out in the field all the time are, are things like a 4K Apple TV to a 4K TV. Sounds simple, right? You grab your HDMI cable, you plug one into the other, and you're good to go. Not always the case, unfortunately. There's a lot of configuration that has to be done, and um, we'll talk a little bit later about TVs and specific inputs you might have to use for HDR. Uh, 4K Blu-ray player to a 4K TV, we're dealing with the same kind of thing. Um, you may have to configure the, the uh, device a little bit differently and, and, of course, check those calibration settings in the player. Um, number three, when we're going through things like an AVR, does the AVR have any settings? Can you change the output resolution of the AVR? Can the AVR do upscaling? Does it need to do any upscaling? It, does the AVR have any video controls? All important things to check. What about when you have multiple sources, I'm um, sorry, multiple 4K sources to multiple 4K TVs? Is your infrastructure 18 gig capable? Is that matrix switch 18 gig capable? Are we buying all these 4K sources and hooking them up to all these 4K TVs through a matrix switch that can't handle 18 gigs? Is that signal ever going to, to uh, reach the, the display properly? Probably not, so stuff to check. Um, where it gets really interesting is when you have multiple resolution sources to 4K and 2K TVs. So perfect example, maybe you have a, a big home with a distributed video system. Um, you know, four, four of the TVs in the home are 4K, but there's that one TV out on the back patio that's still 1080p. How do we make sure that that TV on the back patio is, is still getting a signal? Uh, it's not going to be able to accept and show a 4K signal, but it's um, but there's some tricks that we can do to to make all that happen. And again, number seven for matrix switches and um, and extenders and things like that. We we're dealing with some older things that can only handle you know 10.2 gigs, and we're trying to shove an 18 gig signal through that pipeline. So everything matters in 2018. Just a quick trip down memory lane. Some of you may recognize some of the stuff if you've been in the game for a while. Uh, these are older calibration tools that we used to use, and, and they certainly had their place in their time, but um, we've certainly moved on from there. On the left side of the screen, you see the old Philips kit. Um, this was pretty unique because, uh, especially thinking about how things are now, we didn't have a... Uh, uh, we didn't have any software back then. We, we didn't have things like Calman, and, and we didn't have to use laptops to, to drive everything. This was a system that was all kind of self-contained. On the left side of the picture, you see the signal generator that was capable of a couple different resolutions. And you know, maybe if it was lucky, we had eight, ten test patterns to work with. The piece in the middle was the actual light meter that you would suction cup onto the screen. And the the piece on the right that's connected to the light meter with the phone cord looking cord. Um, that was the, uh, that was your analyzer. So after you read the light coming off the screen, you had to look at this little screen to figure out what your X and Y coordinates were and, and how bright things were. Uh, this was a $10,000 kit in its day. Um, and I still see them every once in a while. Uh, the middle kit, I'm sorry, the middle piece is a Sencor, um, VP403. 
uh, this was kind of the next evolution in calibration tools. We could do multiple resolutions. Um, we the, at this point they'd stepped it up to a DVI connection, which could be adapted to uh, HDMI and component and things like that. Different signal formats. Um, it even had a coax input, so we could calibrate the TV's internal tuner. Um, and this was a big deal, guys. This was huge stuff back in the day. And to accompany that, on the right hand side of the screen, you have the old Sencor Color Pro Five color emitter, which again was was a great piece in its time, but when we're dealing with things today, like wide color gamuts and, and very high luminance levels, uh, and, and especially in like dedicated theater rooms and stuff like that, uh, a meter like this isn't quite exactly the right tool anymore. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the newer tools that we're using. Um, you know, displays have changed so much in the last five years, you know, much less 10 or 15 years. Um, the... Uh, the old tube TVs, the way that they, uh, their, their spectral response, the way that they put out light is a lot different than what you'd say, uh, see on, say, like an OLED uh, or even an LED LCD panel. Um, we're dealing with, of course, higher resolutions like 4K. We're dealing with high dynamic range signals like HDR10 and Dolby Vision. We're dealing with wide color gamuts like P3 and Rec 2020. So, um, you know, tools have to, to keep up with the... Um, the, the devices that we're working with. So just a couple of examples here. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you've got a Meridio 6G pattern generator, which is fully 18 gig capable, HDR, wide color gamut, all that fun stuff. Same thing with the Video Forge Pro uh, over here, the little red and, and black box. Uh, it's a great little piece as well. Same thing, Dolby Vision, HDR, 18 gig, uh, 4K resolutions. Um, as far as light meters go, we're dealing with uh, some very common spectral devices, such as the i1 Pro 2, which you see right here. Also the Jetty, uh, I believe that's called a 1511. Very, very good spectral devices. And then you have some uh, color emitters that are a, a lot better for today's TVs. Like, for example, the Klein K10, which you see in white, and the SpectraCal C6 that you see that's red and black on the right side of the screen. Um, back in the day, if you had a TV that was kicking out, let's say 100 nits of luminance, that was a really big deal. Um, and it was, uh, you know, that was kind of the holy grail back in the day. but. You know, we're completely blowing that out of the water now. We're seeing um, these HDR standards that are that are you know anywhere from a thousand to four thousand to even ten thousand nits. So if I took a meter like this, the Color Pro Five, if I put that up to a a, a TV that was putting out a thousand nits of luminance, I could literally destroy that meter. I could I could blind it. I mean, imagine uh, what happens when you look at the sun for a second and you kind of have those white spots in your eyes afterwards. Um, you know, that that's physical damage to, to something like a meter, whereas your eyes can re re recover. So um, we we have to start looking at new tools if we're getting serious about new displays. So that includes pattern generators that are capable of, of high dynamic range and uh, 4K resolutions. And, and we're talking also about um, light meters that can read these really, really bright light levels. So first we'll talk a little bit about uh, the meters that we use in the field to calibrate TVs. Um, the two that are most common are spectral devices and colorimeters. And there's always kind of this um, conversation around, well, which one do I use and which one is better? And, you know, it's just like anything else, guys. There's, there's always the right tool for the job. And, you know, what I've experienced personally in the last 10 years uh, with spectral devices, they tend to be very, very accurate. But... The, the trade-off is they're a little slow, um, especially when you're reading the darker levels of a TV. So for example, if you're trying to read you know, five IRE or 10 or 20 IRE, um, these are the darkest parts of the grayscale. So when you pull up these test patterns, they're not that much brighter than, than what, how the TV makes black. So if you have a spectral device that's kind of slow in the first place, and then on top of that, you're trying to read darker light levels, you, know, you could be sometimes taking up to 20 or 30 seconds to take, take a reading. And, uh, you know, that could be a little frustrating. So the, the answer to that is, well, why don't you just use a colorimeter, which is a very good solution. The colorimeters come with their drawbacks, though, as well. They do tend to be a lot faster than a spectral device in a lot of cases. Um, but the trade-off is, is they have to be recalibrated once a year if, if we're doing this right. Um, so, you know, you're down for a week while it's back in the lab. Um, they also tend to be not quite as accurate as a spectral device. So where you get the speed, you kind of lose out in the accuracy in a lot of cases. So SpectraCal came up with a very, very awesome um, feature in CalMan called meter profiling. So what you can do now with a meter with, with, with profiling 
is I can take a spectral device such as an i1 Pro 2 that's known for its accuracy, and I can profile that to something that's much faster, say a Klein or a, or a SpectraCal C6, and basically we can mimic the spectral device with the colorimeter. So you regain the accuracy, but you also retain the speed of the colorimeter all at the same time. So um, you know if, if you happen to be you know running with two of these meters in your in your calibration kit, why not use both? Why not take advantage of of what's great about both of those? Um, we used to use these blue filters. You see them sometimes. They they come with calibration discs, uh, and I still see them here and there um, in calibration kits. Those blue filters were great in their heyday. They were they were used to uh, look at the SMPTE color bar test pattern and adjust things on a CRT TV such as color and tint. In 2018, you should not be using these blue filters. They the spectral response of a OLED TV or LCD TV is m hugely different than the spectral response of a CRT. There are better tools these days. Um, a lot of times when you're trying to adjust color and tint, you can use sometimes a blue only mode built into the TV instead of using the, uh, the inaccurate uh, blue filter that you hold over your face. And again, recalibration, that comes up a lot. Uh, certain spectral devices like the i1 Pro 2, you calibrate that guy every time you use it. So there's really no point in sending it into the lab once a year, but a colorimeter, um, if you want that to stay as accurate as possible and that's all you have and you don't have a spectral device to profile it to, no big deal. Uh, just plan on once a year or maybe once every 18 months. Uh, sending that into uh, SpectraCal, they they will put your colorimeter up next to a $40,000 reference spectral device and they'll create a lookup table for your colorimeter so it stays accurate throughout its life. So a couple things that um, I've added to my calibration kit um, in the last two years are HDMI signal analyzers. Like I said before, um, it's really hard to calibrate the TV for HDR if the TV is not getting the HDR signal in the first place. So you really have two choices when it comes to troubleshooting this. You can spend you know an hour for for example troubleshooting you know component by component and swapping out HDMI cables and 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 you're spending a lot of time troubleshooting the system, or you can use some tools like signal analyzers that you can plug directly into the source, and you can figure out what resolution's coming out of the source, what the frame rate is, uh, what the bandwidth is, what uh, chroma subsampling it's using, uh, all kinds of cool stuff. Now, what you see in the middle of the screen, that's called a Meridio 6A, and it's kind of a natural, um, a natural accessory if you already have a, a Meridio 6G, because once those two are paired together, you can do things like test HDMI cables and test infrastructure, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, if you already have a 6G, you can buy the 6A by itself. You don't have to rebuy the kit or anything like that. On the left side of the screen is a really cool little tool. Um, even if you're not calib if, if you're not calibrating a lot or if you don't calibrate at all, I would I would consider something like the Fox and the Hound kit. And those are the green and gray boxes that you see on the left. Um, they don't have the full-blown calibration capabilities like the Meridio 6G does, but it's an amazing troubleshooting tool. So imagine that you are, um, uh, imagine you have a rack of equipment in a basement and the TV you're troubleshooting is upstairs in the master bedroom. Uh, well, instead of playing with settings um, on the component and then running upstairs and looking at the TV, seeing if it's still flashing or something like that, you can use this kit and you can use the analyzer. The analyzer will mimic your display. So you could stand right there by the rack and um, and uh, plug your analyzer into the output of the of the rack, and you can see exactly what's going on on the screen and what the TV would be showing. Um, really cool stuff. And with the generator, you can kind of do the opposite. Maybe you're trying to troubleshoot the infrastructure. You don't want to run up and downstairs over and over again. So why not take the generator up to the television, plug it straight into the TV? Now you can bypass the entire infrastructure, and you can do some troubleshooting to the TV. So. Um, you know, these tools I've added to my kit, like I said before, and, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm all about working smarter, not harder and, and, and not spending, you know, multiple hours troubleshooting a system. And these tools will definitely help you with stuff like that. Here's a, here's an example of the Meridio 6A and the screen. Um, what we saw with the, uh, with the Meridio 6A, this was a, this was a brand new movie that came out uh, a little over a year ago. And uh, it's one of the first movies and still is one of the very few movies that are mastered um, with uh, 60 frames per second. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to see 
you know, what kind of bandwidth the Blu-ray player uh, was having to deal with with the movie with that high of a frame rate. So this is the screen from the 6A analyzer. The 6A analyzer is plugged directly into the um, into the into the Blu-ray player. Now we can get all this data and all these numbers, but um, if you were to push a button on the 6A analyzer, you could also see an actual picture. So it mimics the display. So here's what we saw coming out of the Blu-ray player for this particular movie. Uh, it was 3840 by 2160p, so that's 4K. It was 29.936 hertz, so that's your frame rate, 60 frames per second. The color space was set to 422 with a color gamut of Rec 2020. Now, what's interesting about this in this particular Blu-ray player, there's there was no uh, there was no way of telling the Blu-ray player did this until you analyze the signal. As we all know, the uh, chroma subsampling that's on the disc itself is 420, but look at what's coming out of the Blu-ray player, 422. So the Blu-ray player is doing some upscaling to the to the chroma. We wouldn't have known that otherwise. Uh, there's also an indicator here for HDCP. It'll tell you which version of HDCP that the uh, pl that the player is outputting. Um, that becomes important if you're dealing with a retrofit system. Maybe you have some legacy components in that system. If anyone's ever dealt with a um, a, uh, an, a, a an older version of HDCP with newer components, you you sometimes see that kind of flashing screen. Um, we want you guys to be able to know exactly what you're dealing with. Uh, you also see that the uh, TMDS bandwidth, here's what we're looking for right here. This particular movie at 60 frames per second, 4K Rec 2020 with HDR, uh, that was 17.8 gigs. Remember guys, the standard right now is 18 gigs. So with this one particular movie, we were already kind of at the limits of, of what the system could handle. If you were to do things like, um, you know, make the resolution 1080p instead of, uh, instead of 4K, you'd see the bandwidth drop. So you could literally make adjustments to the output of the Blu-ray player and, and see it all live on the screen for the 6A. Uh, HDR metadata is present, so we know that's an HDR disc. Um, there's uh, audio frequencies here. There's uh, This particular system was set up for two channels, so you see that the front left and front right speakers were the ones that were working. So lots and lots of good data here. And again, this will help you with troubleshooting and, and just getting a general feel of how these signals work. Something that I've had to use quite a bit lately, especially in uh, systems that had legacy devices in them, uh, is the scaler. Uh, this is one example of, of scalers. Uh, this is one from AV Pro Connect. It's called an SC1. Uh, this thing really, uh, really will save you in a pinch. Um, it's about the size of a deck of cards. It really doesn't need much configuration. And, and once you set it to, to what you need it for, you don't really have to mess with it ever again. So. Um, it's powered via USB, so in best case scenario, you could slap it behind the TV, maybe throw some Velcro on the back of the TV, um, set everything you need to set it, and plug this into the USB port of the TV, and it's out of sight, out of mind. You never have to worry about it again. But it really serves three purposes, this device particularly. Um, it's an EDID manager. It comes with 16 different preset EDIDs, including some HDR EDIDs, as you can see towards the bottom. And there's even a slot for a user-defined EDID. So if you had to do something custom for a for particular situation, you can. This thing can also upscale and downscale. So let's go back to that um, situation we talked about earlier where everything in the house is 4K except for that one TV that's out on the back patio that's still 1080p. Well, how can we get that TV to show a signal if it's got a 4K, if the system has a 4K infrastructure and this is only a 1080p TV? Uh, what the SC1 will do, uh, it'll downscale the signal going into that TV from 4K down to 1080p. So that will still show picture. It can also go the other way too. If you're dealing with uh, a mixed system with 2K and 4K stuff, this can also upscale from 2K to 4K. What's cool about it is if you do upscale 4K to 2K, uh, I'm sorry, if you do upscale 2K to 4K, there is something in here called a 2K to 4K video enhancement. Um, so if you're dealing with bigger screens and you're dealing with lower resolutions, you can use that video enhancement. It has three different settings and you can add a little bit of extra sharpness to the picture too. So again, tools like this are making our lives a little bit easier. But um, we have to be very, very aware of the entire signal chain. This is another device that saved my butt a couple times. Um, this is called a DA12AUHD. Uh, this is a one input, two output HDMI splitter. Um, so it, it's pretty much a, a, a simple device. It doesn't really do much other than split the signal into two different outputs. Um, it does have an EDID manager built in, so you can do custom EDIDs and, and have some preset EDIDs and things like that. But uh, this little guy here is um, fully HDR compliant, fully Dolby Vision compliant, 18 gigs, all that fun stuff. Um, so let's take a quick look at how this helped me with a system. 
I visited a client to calibrate his 86 inch TV that was hanging on the wall. Um, the AVR and all the other components were in a closet about 25 or, or 30 feet away. And the problem that we had uh, after doing some investigation, the initial problem was that we couldn't get HDR to trigger on the television, no matter what we did with the output of the Blu-ray player and the, and the streaming device and, and everything in the system. So it turns out after doing a little bit of an investigation that that particular receiver couldn't pass 18 gigs and 4K and HDR. Well, this puts you in kind of an awkward position as an integrator, as a calibrator, because, you know, we want we the whole point of, of calibration is to get the, the most out of the system and to get the very best picture and the very best sound. Uh, but you might be dealing with a component like the receiver that can't pass those high bandwidth signals. So, you know, maybe this receiver and this was actually the case in this scenario, but maybe the receiver was some really high end um, receiver that was fantastic with audio, but now it was kind of outdated with video. Um, you know, not everybody wants to run out and spend another five grand or eight grand or even a thousand dollars on a brand new receiver. Maybe it's not in the budget quite yet. So here's a trick you can use uh, that eight, that that one by two splitter to still get the best of both uh, audio and video. So the way the system ended up being configured, um, everything that initially, all the sources are running to the receiver and the receiver just had an output going to the television. Pretty common stuff. Uh, there was a cable box, a 4K HDR streaming device, a 4K HDR uh, PC that he had built and, and was rack mounted, was really cool. And then there was a 4K UHD Blu-ray player. Now, luckily on the Blu-ray player, it did have two HDMI outputs. Um, so we were able to, to, um, to use that quite effectively. But what about the streaming device and the 4K PC that only had one HDMI output? So your choices are, do I run everything to the TV and get the 4K HDR video and then just go optical to the receiver, but then I miss out on all my you know, Dolby True HD and all my high bandwidth uh, audio formats too. The other option is to run everything to the receiver, HDMI, and then HDMI out to the receiver to the TV. Now I get all my HD, you know, Dolby True HD and, and things like that for sound, but now I'm missing out on HDR on the television. So there's the, there's a way to get around all this, and that's by using the the one by two. So if you take a look at how this ended up being at the end of the day. The, for the streaming device, the HDMI output went to the input of the 1x2. One of the outputs went straight to the TV, HDMI. The second output went straight to the receiver, HDMI. Now, because we did it like this, we're getting the best video signal to the TV that we can. And because we had separate HDMI for audio, the receiver getting the best audio that it can too. So this was kind of the workaround to for this particular client. Um, who wasn't really too keen on the thought of going out and buying a new $5,000 receiver. This was a good and expensive solution. Now, basically the same thing, but uh, you know, kind of rinse and repeat for the 4K PC. So one output to the TV, one output to the receiver. And then for the Blu-ray player, because it already had two outputs, it was a little bit easier. One output to the TV, one output to the receiver. A little bit of reprogramming on the remote because now you're dealing with multiple inputs on the receiver and the TV. But not a big deal, guys. This was the easiest way, most effective way to uh, get around some of these legacy devices. All right. What about HDMI cables? This is a big one. Um, earlier in uh, earlier in my career, I remember you know people were running out and buying 3D televisions and 3D Blu-ray players, which was great for us. You know, it, it gave us work and um, it. it more than anything, taught us how to how to troubleshoot because if anyone was doing this type of work back then, you would remember that you didn't. It wasn't a matter of just upgrading the the new player and and buying um, you know, buying the new TV and, and buying the the 3D movies, but it was a matter of also upgrading the HDMI cable. You know, some HDMI cables that were maybe only capable of you know nine gigs or something. Now we're trying to put 14 gigs through it for 3D signals. So um, the, the cables I've been using recently who that have done really well for me are the, uh, the bullet train cables. Uh, they come in two varieties. There's uh, you know the normal plain old copper cables that we've used for years. And then they have another type of cable called the long haul, the middle picture there, uh, which is an active optical cable, AOC. Now what's cool about that is the audio and the video actually travel down a fiber optic lead inside of that HDMI cable and everything else is still copper. So it's kind of a hybrid cable. Um, and for those of you who've who've made some of these longer HDMI runs, you know that the um, the uh, HDMI cables, once you get about 15, 20 feet or longer, um, some of them can become kind of flaky. I mean, it, it's a lot of of work for that cable 
to transmit a high bandwidth signal over a long length. So that was kind of the answer with the long haul cables. So those long haul cables, you can go 15, you know, 30, 40 meters if you need to. So it's another good solution. Um, also, what about extenders and, and, and balins? Um, you know, if, if you're upgrading the client system to, to 4K and to HDR, don't forget about that balin. You know, that balin might only be, be good for, uh, you know, 10.2 gigs or something like that. So, again, I'll reiterate it. Um, you know, when it comes to doing this type of work these days, everything matters. The extenders, the cables, the receivers, and, of course, the devices themselves. So, we talked a little bit earlier about... Um, you know, testing the HDMI cables and making sure that you're you're putting um, 18 gig HDMI cables into the system. Now, you know, sometimes you may have a cable that's not labeled, or you know, maybe it's um, maybe it's a new brand of cable that you're dealing with. Um, you know, it's it's always a good idea to test the HDMI cable before you run it. You know, through the attic and and through the home. Uh, this is something that I try to do uh, anytime I'm doing a helping somebody with a fresh install. So if we were using something like the Meridio 6A and 6G or, or a Fox and Hound kit or something like that, um, you could plug the generator, I'm sorry, you could plug the HDMI cable into the generator, plug the other end of the HDMI cable into the analyzer, and you can actually do a cable test before you install the cable into the wall. So quick example on the left side of the screen that you see, um, this is an example of good. Uh, we've got a five volt hot plug that's, that says okay, and we have zero errors on all three data channels. Uh, the DDC says pass, HDP says pass. So this is an example of, of a good cable. So now I know as an installer, I can go ahead and run this cable inside the wall and it's not gonna give me any troubles. On the right side of the screen is an example of bad. So we did get a five volt hot plug, but on data channel zero, one, and two, there's no signal and the DDC fails and the HPD fails. So this tells me not to use this cable um, and, and maybe try another one. So. Uh, cable testing is super important. I've I've been in those situations before myself where I crawl up in the attic and and run a you know 20 foot HDMI cable from you know a closet to to the display uh, to only to find out that that HD, HDMI cable is not up to par or maybe it's damaged in some way. So always 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 test your cables before they go in. And really, if you're on a if you're on a brand new fresh install or if you're doing like some pre wiring type stuff, uh, I can't stress enough how how important it is and how smart it is to use conduit. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I would much rather just pull the old cable out with the new cable uh, versus crawling up in the attic and and uh, you know running new cables. Plus, you also have to remember if you come back five years later, the drywall is already up. You know it, it might be impossible to to run a new cable um, depending on how the home is built or, or whatever the case is. So, uh, if you have the opportunity, definitely definitely run conduit. It makes your life a lot easier when you go back to upgrade those cables in a couple more years. So the actual calibration process, um, I want to walk you kind of through it step by step and show you some of the things that I do um, to make sure that um, everything's up to date and the uh, inputs on the TV are con uh, um, configured correctly and the devices are configured correctly. Number one, guys, firmware update all of your devices before you do anything. Um, we talked earlier about Avatar not playing on a lot of Blu-ray players until the firmware was updated. And guys, we're starting to see that again. It's come full circle. So make sure your, your Blu-ray player is updated. Make sure your streaming devices are updated. Make sure your display is updated. Um, mismatches in firmware and old firmware versions. There's a reason they update firmware on, on a regular basis. They're fixing bugs and they're, and they're making the products work better. So always make sure your firmware is up to date. Um, I try to make it a, a point to, um, you know, if the TV has, for example, like an auto update, uh, I, I do like to turn that on. That way the client doesn't have to worry about updates and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but that's always a good idea. Verify that every component in the system can handle 18 gigs. Uh, that includes the receiver, any extenders that you might using, uh, splitters, matrix switches, all that kind of stuff. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of uh, a quick even Google search. You know, you type in the model number of the receiver and look at the specs and, you know, maybe it's from 2013 and doesn't say anything about 4K or HDR. Um, Number three, the third bullet point on this page is super, super important right now. We have to make sure that the display is configured for 4K and HDR. So you might have a display that has four or five HDMI inputs. Well, guess what? Not all of them, all, not all of them might not be compatible with, with 4K and HDR. So sometimes it's a matter of putting it in the right input. Some TVs, all the inputs are capable of 18 gigs, but 
maybe you have to flip a switch in the TV. That's also a possibility. Every manufacturer is a little bit different. Some TVs, you have to put it in the right input and flip the switch in the TV. So let's look at a couple different examples of that. Number one, uh, Sony. In our experience so far, and what I've seen so far in, in the field, not all of the Sony, um, not all the inputs on the Sony are 4K 18 gig capable. Uh, in most cases, what I see is that you have to be using HDMI 2 or 3, okay? Uh, also, once you are in the right input, now you have to go into the setup menu, the HDMI signal format menu in the Sony TV, and you have to change the signal format from enhanced to standard. And if you don't do both of those things, getting it in the right input and flipping the TV over to enhanced, you're, you're, the, the TV's EDIT is never going to ask for 4K and HDR signals from the, from the source. On LG TVs, um, what we've seen lately is that usually all of the inputs are 18 gig capable, but you do have to go into the, the general settings of the TV and you have to make sure that HDMI deep color is turned on for the input that you're dealing with. Vizio, kind of like Sony, not all the inputs are 18 gig capable. Some of them are, some of them aren't. So you have to figure out which one's the right one and you have to turn that input onto full UHD color in the Vizio menu. Samsung is a little more like Viz or more like uh, LG rather. Um, usually all the inputs are 18 gig capable, but you do have to go into the menu of the Samsung and you have to turn that input that you're dealing with, uh, you have to turn that on for HDMI UHD color. If you're not sure, check the owner's manual. Uh, you could always give AV Pro a call, uh, call the tech support line and uh, a lot of the stuff we have on file because we've run into it before. Uh, but this stuff's usually pretty easy to find with a little bit of searching, but you have to do it. That's the point. On this page, we'll look a little bit, uh, we'll look at uh, a little bit at the, um, you know, three of the big ones at least. Uh, these are what some of those menus look like and what some of those, uh, what some of those uh, switches look like. On the left side of the screen, you've got a, a screenshot from an LG TV. Um, in this case, I was using HDMI 2. Uh, it didn't matter the input, but you do have to go in and turn these things on for the inputs that you're using. Here's an example of a Sony. Uh, the Sony even tells you, in this particular case it did at least, that you have to be using inputs two and three and you have to switch this over to enhanced. And for the Samsung, you can use any input you'd like, but you do have to turn that, the HDMI UHD color, you do have to turn those things on. Now, when these things are turned on and configured correctly, now that edit of the TV will ask the source for a 4K HDR signal. Uh, if you don't do these things, you will get a picture. It's probably just gonna be 1080p. And they do this on purpose, guys. Uh, we get this question a lot. Why don't they just make all the inputs 18 gig capable? You have to remember what the manufacturer is trying to do. They're trying to keep manufacturing costs down and, and they're also trying to prevent returns as well. The, the, the chips that are on those inputs for 18 gigs are much more expensive than a normal 1080p chip. So you know, if, if they put 18 gig chips on all five inputs on the TV, that's gonna raise the cost of the TV. Um, the other reason they do that too is because you know, if, if you plugged in a 4K source to a 4K TV and didn't get a picture at all or, or something like that, then you're going to probably return the TV. That's the most logical thing to do, right? Like it's broken. I'm not getting a picture. Something's wrong with it. I take it back. So they want to do these things on purpose. They want you to get a picture so you don't return the TV, uh, but it might not be configured correctly. So we have to make sure at, before we calibrate the system that all this stuff is set up correctly in the first place. After you verify that the signal chain is configured correctly, your, your inputs on your TV or your projector are configured correctly, now you can actually start the physical calibration of, this, of, the, of the display in the, in the video system. So uh, the first thing we're, we're gonna do, which hasn't changed at all, um, you're gonna take your signal generator, you're gonna take your uh, light meter or meters, and you're gonna connect them via USB to the laptop. Uh, we are starting to see certain meters, uh, like the Jetty that we looked at before, um, the Jetty does have a Bluetooth uh, capability built in, so you don't necessarily have to hook up the Jetty to your laptop via USB. That becomes really helpful if you're calibrating in a lot of dark environments. It's you know it's one less cable to worry about tripping over and things like that. Um, but you know we're still for the most part going to be using USB. Question we get asked a lot is where do I put the meter? On a flat panel, it's pretty simple. Um, on a flat panel TV, you're, you're typically staring at the middle of the screen. So you wanna get your meter to the middle of the screen as best as you can. Um, it, it needs to be flush against the screen. Uh, that way there's no light pollution from you know, any lights that might be on in the room or any windows that might be open. Uh, for a flat panel, it's pretty simple. Uh, try to get in the middle as best as you can. That's where your test patterns are gonna be. Pretty straightforward. On the left side of the screen, you'll see that um, you'll see two meters on tripods. And this was set up for a projector. The question we get all the time in ISF class is, do I face the meter towards the screen or do I face the meter towards the projector? 
it's a good question. But what you have to excuse me, what you have to remember is that the screen is part of the system. We've tested many screens in the past that shifted the color a little bit. So if the screen is part of the system, we want to we want to include that as part of the calibration. So your best bet in a projector type of situation is you want to get the meter pretty close to the screen, but not exactly right up on it because you know you have to give it a little bit of uh, you have to give the the light a little bit of room to bounce off the screen. So I tend to uh, I tend to stick with keeping it about six to eight inches away from the screen. And if you notice, uh, those meters are kind of up at about a 30 or maybe 45 degree angle. If you set those meters to be flat so they're perfectly perpendicular with the screen, the problem that you have now is you have the projector shining light onto the meter and then the meter is shining, I'm sorry, the, that light's not making it to the, to the screen. So you're aiming your meter into its own shadow. So you can kind of figure out how, you know, why that's a bad idea. So again, about six to eight inches away from the screen, uh, angle it up a little bit, about 45 degrees is, is usually pretty good. Um, and then you can kind of continue on. I don't want to get too deep into SDR calibration just because, you know, we've done that for, for many years now. We, we have that down pat. There's really nothing new in SDR calibration other than, um, you know, things. For example, 20 point grayscale calibration. We've seen that now for a couple of years. Uh, CMS now we've seen for a couple of years. The SDR calibration is still pretty straightforward. Um, some things that are new though for 2018 are things like AutoCal. So uh, a few slides down the road, we'll get a little deeper into AutoCal, but you know, imagine if you're calibrating a TV with a 20 point white balance, you know, that could take, you know, even somebody like me who's done this thousands of times, that could take me 20, 30 minutes, depending on how, you know, how well the controls are behaving and how well the TV is responding. Uh, when we get into things like AutoCal, you knock some of that stuff down into, you know, instead of 20 or 30 minutes, you knock some of that stuff down into maybe two to three minutes. So, uh, but calibrating the SDR is still the same. Nothing's really changed too much there, uh, except for the addition of things like AutoCal. Um, once you get the SDR calibrated, uh, you're not done with the system yet. There's still a lot more work to do. Um, just because you calibrated the SDR part of the TV doesn't mean that the HDR part of the TV is calibrated. Uh, they don't share settings or anything like that because they, the signals work in completely different ways. So what we're seeing is, uh, I'll use LG as an example. If I'm feeding the LG a normal 1080p standard dynamic range signal, uh, the LG TV, when you go into the menu and you look at the picture presets, you have all the same presets that you've always seen. You know, vivid, standard, uh, APS mode for energy savings, you know, ISF bright and ISF dark. Um, you know, that all, that's all still the same. Now, what's different is if you're feeding that TV an HDR signal, when you go into the picture menu now, you have completely different preset picture modes. And inside of those modes, you have completely different um, uh, settings as well. So you know, you're almost at a point now where you're not you're not just doing one calibration on the TV. You might be doing two. Well, let's add another layer to that. What if the TV is Dolby Vision? So now you have to calibrate for SDR, HDR10, and Dolby Vision. So there's three calibrations right there in one sitting in one TV. On top of that, what if you're doing day modes and night modes because it's in a living room with windows? So um, you, you you have to think about uh, this is a good a good time to kind of think about you know how much time you quote for your calibrations, how much money you're charging for your calibrations. You know something that used to take two hours might take four now. So charge accordingly for that, especially if you've invested the time and money into into these new updated tools. Um, you know you you want that to you know, that, that should reflect in your price that you're charging. Um, a couple of just in, interesting things about HDR. Um, we're dealing with 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 absolutes now. We're not dealing with things like like for example with gamma. Uh, gamma has always been this kind of wishy washy thing. Uh, we didn't really know what movies were mastered at what gamma. That that information was hard to find sometimes. Gamma was always you know about oh is this room bright or is it or is it dark or is it kind of in the middle. So it was always kind of a judgment call uh, on the calibrator's end to what gamma he should use. Well. We're not using gamma anymore in HDR. We're using something called EOTF, electro optical transfer function. And basically that's, I have an electrical signal, how much light do I put out? That's the TV's job. Uh, on the opposite end of things, like with a camera, it's opto-electrical, opto, I always mess it up, 
opto elect, optical electrical transfer function, opto electrical transfer function. Yeah, I think that's it. So that's doing the opposite. That's taking in light and turning that into uh, into electrical signals. Uh, now with HDR, these things are absolutes. And we'll talk about that on a graph here on the next page or so. Other things to consider too, uh, what about the TV's internal apps? Um, you know, I've, I've even tested this myself and I see it all the time. Um, if I watch a movie on Netflix, for example, like one of the Netflix originals, that's Dolby Vision. In fact, uh, I'll give you a good example. Um, um, uh, oh man, I'm having a, uh, drawn a blank on the, on the name of the, there, there's a, there's a show that I'm almost on the last episode of, um, Altered Carbon on Netflix. Uh, I'm on the, about on the last episode of that. And one of the great things about that show is it looks really, really good. And it's in Dolby Vision. So you can even do this test for yourself. If you have a Dolby Vision capable, say, streaming device, watch an episode of that show uh, via the TV's internal app and watch that same episode again uh, from your streaming device. And what I notice is that when I use the internal app, the picture is just much sharper. Um, it's got a lot more punch to it, a lot less noise and, and things like that. So, um, you know, it, again, if we're, you know, if we're going off of trying to get the best picture possible, I'm recommending to my to my customers and my clients to use the TV's internal app instead of getting the app from a from an outside source. Now, here's the question. If you are watching Altered Carbon on Netflix in the TV, does that have it, its own setting? Does that need to be calibrated too? And the answer is yes. Because when you're using the internal uh, streaming apps on the TV, you can push menu, you can go to picture, and you've got a, all your picture settings that are there for the HDMI inputs are there for your internal streaming apps too. So don't forget your internal streaming. Make sure those are uh, make sure those are calibrated too. Um, now, what we're seeing now with HDR is the TV isn't always able to get bright enough to match how the content was mastered. So let's say, for example, you have a, a movie that's mastered at a thousand nits, which is pretty bright. That means that you know if you're watching a sunset scene in this movie and the camera pans past the sun. The sun might get really bright for a few seconds while it's in the frame, while the rest of the picture stays the same luminance that it was before. And that's what happens in real life. I mean, if you go out to the beach and you watch the sunset, um, the whole scene doesn't get brighter as the sun gets, or I'm sorry, the whole scene doesn't uh, necessarily get darker. Uh, the sun can get brighter. The reflections off the waves can get brighter. Those are called specular highlights. And that's what's so, one of the things that's so great about HDR. So you might have a movie that's mastered at a thousand nits, right? So you have these specular highlights that are at a thousand nits. Well, what if the TV is only capable of 700 nits? You don't want to lose the signal. You don't want to clip the signal. And just a quick review, clipping. If I look up at a cloud in the sky, I can see details in the cloud. If the signal is clipped, it looks like one big white blob. We've lost detail in the brightest part of the picture. That's clipping. So in order for the TV not to clip out all those beautiful specular highlights, the TV has to do something called tone mapping. Um, the, the, the image will still have all of those details in it, but you're not gonna hit that thousand nit target because the TV can't get that bright. But because of the tone mapping, the TV can still show the highlights, which is always really good. And you don't have to worry about uh, bright scenes being blown out and things like that. So um, before you calibrate the HDR, you do have to set the generator up to output an HDR signal. And it's just a matter of a few settings, but if you forget some of this stuff or you don't do it, uh, you're never going to get the TV to trigger HDR, and you're never going to be able to look at any HDR test patterns. So just a couple of things right off the bat. Um, when you're calibrating HDR, uh, use 10% windows. Uh, we found that we found the best results with those so far. Uh, make sure you're aiming for the correct color space. So that might be P3, it might be Rec 2020. Um, regardless of the color space that you're aiming for, we still use D65 as the white point. That's always the same, and who knows, will probably never change. I bet. Um, you have to make sure that the, the generator is outputting an HDR signal. So there's a drop down screen that you can choose either off HDR 10 or Dolby Vision. Uh, we're not using gamma values anymore. We're using EOTF. And what you want to choose for that is the uh, ST2084. Uh, we have the resolution set to 4K. Uh, color format, depending on the monitor. If you're calibrating a computer monitor or a TV, you might set that to either full or, um, or limited. And the bit depth. Um, that's set to 10. In the spec for HDR, the bit depth can be either 10 or 12. Um, now, I've done this myself because uh, when this stuff was brand new, you know, a year or two ago, I asked myself a question. I was like, you know, does it really matter if the generator is outputting, you know, 
eight bit versus 10 bit if I'm doing things like grayscale adjustments. And what I found by uh, testing a little bit was that the grayscale numbers didn't really change at all based on if I had the bit depth on the generator set to eight or 10 bits. So I haven't found a, a, uh, I haven't found a reason yet to, to always output it in 10 bit. If anybody else has a different experience, you know, surely, surely let me know, but I haven't, I haven't seen that really make a difference yet, but um, the spec does call for 10 bit. So, uh, you know, go ahead and set it to 10 bit to be safe. The other thing that's important to call out is uh, for the longest time now, we've used a uh, Delta formula called Delta E2000. And basically what the Delta is, is it says, okay, here's your target. Here's where you really landed. If, if, the, if you landed on target, perfect bullseye, then there's no Delta error, it's zero. But if you're really close, but not quite on target, you might have a Delta error of say one or two or 1.7 or whatever the Delta error is. And that just tells you that you're not quite on target, but you're pretty close, zero is considered perfect. And Delta E2000 worked really well when we were dealing with Rec 709 and um, standard dynamic range and stuff. But now that we're dealing with so much more dynamic range and so much more color, um, there's a new uh, Delta E formula called uh, I ICTCP. And this is a setting that you can change in the, in the Calman settings. So with HDR, make sure you're using the correct Delta formula. Make sure you have the generator outputting correctly. And then from here, guys, calibrating the HDR is a breeze. It was a very scary thing uh, even a year ago. Um, HDR calibration was this huge question. Uh, we didn't really quite understand the signals and things like that yet. Um, but you know, now that we've got some practice with it and the manufacturers have made the controls a little bit easier, um, you know, the, calibrating the HDR is really just a matter of a couple things. Number one, whether you're calibrating Dolby Vision or HDR10, make sure you pick the proper workflow in CalMan. Uh, there's, an, there's an analysis workflow, and there's also a calibration workflow for each format. Uh, the analysis workflow is good for quick checks. You, you want to test the TV's capabilities. You don't really need to make any changes to it. You just want to see. You can use the analysis workflow. But if you're going to be making actual adjustments to the TV and, and adjusting the grayscale and things like that, make sure you do use the, uh, the uh, there's a Dolby Vision custom workflow, and then there's an HDR10 workflow as well. So make sure you pick the right workflow. That's number one. Um, number two, what we've done in the past with standard dynamic range is, you know, before you calibrate the TV, we, we tend to go through all the different modes and we try to find a mode that gives us the most adjustments and we try to find a mode that's already closest to the target. I'm all about working smarter and not harder. So if I find a mode in the TV that's already pretty close to what I'm aiming for, that's the mode I'm going to calibrate. Well, with HDR, that's not that much different. And you can see that based on these EOTF graphs. So the EOTF, um, like I said before, it, it's not a, a variable thing like gamma was. This is a fixed thing. So we want to try to match the TV to follow the EOTF line as closely as possible because some really nasty things can happen to the picture if, if you deviate from the, from the fixed EOTF line. So there's a good example. The yellow line on the left graph is our target. And the gray line is what Calman actually read off of this television. So as you can see, the lower levels of the grayscale, like 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, that gray line is a little bit higher than the yellow line. So what that tells us is in the, in the picture, these lower levels of the grayscale are a little bit too bright, and we're going to get a washed out picture. And this is super, super obvious on a display like an OLED that has really good black levels. You know, you don't see black if, this, if the system is set up like this. You see like a, like a dark gray. So you're not really taking advantage of everything that TV can do. So here's what I did to get such a clean line on the right side of the screen. This is uh, going to be a big surprise to you guys. I didn't really necessarily calibrate anything to get this nice line. You know what I did? I just picked a more accurate mode uh, from all the different picture presets. In this particular case, it happened to be uh, HDR Cinema. So just by picking a better mode in the TV, we were able to, to get a much, much better EOTF. Now black levels are a lot better. Uh, you know, the, the shadows come out nice and even, and uh, we still have all our specular highlights um, on, the, on the brightest part of the picture too. So just by switching modes for HDR, I was able to get a much better result. There are a couple new test patterns that we'll talk about real quick. Um, the uh, test pattern on the left-hand side is, is more to do with HDR. The test pattern on the right side of the screen is more to do with Dolby Vision and making sure Dolby Vision's uh, triggered on the TV. Um, the left side of the screen uh, we'll talk about that one first. This is kind of a brightness and contrast test pattern for HDR. And the way this is supposed to work, if you're setting this up for reference, 
uh, you know, reference being like I'm in a dedicated theater room with no lights. There's a middle circle in the middle of this test pattern, this middle circle right here. You want to use the OLED light or the backlight of the TV and try to get the HDR mode that you're going to calibrate to 103 nits. That would be considered reference. Now, of course, if you're not in a dedicated theater room, maybe you're in a living room, you might want to go brighter than that, of course. But if you're in a dedicated theater room and you're trying to nail it perfect, try to try to manipulate the device you're working on so that the light output is 103 nits to this gray circle, okay? So there's luminance. Now, how about black level and white level? Take a look at these patterns and take a look at these yellow lines. Everything from where black starts to the yellow line should be black, okay? You should start to see shadow details at the yellow line, and then you're going to get brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And now, as far as which yellow line you reach for the bright part of the picture, that's really depending on what the TV is capable of. So, for example, if I can see details up until about this yellow line, that means the TV is showing up to about 1,000 nits. So I can expect everything from here all the way to the top is just going to be one solid blob or one solid shade of white. So this will give you kind of an analysis on how bright the TV can go and how much white level you're going to get out of it. This is showing you how much black level you're going to get out of it and, uh, and, and where, the, where the shadows and the, and the darker grays start. Now, there are settings in HDR, and if we're doing this correctly, there's some of them. to make sure that it's not too hard to see shadows in a movie. The problem is the EOTF, the, the tone mapping, all of this is a fixed value and it's, and it's all based on the TV's capability. The problem is in HDR, if you start messing with the black level and the, and the white level or, or the brightness and the contrast, you will throw off the tone mapping of the TV. So you may have to pick and choose your battles and that might be a good opportunity to kind of educate your client too. You know, maybe the room is kind of bright so you're, you feel like you have to bring the brightness up in HDR. Well, you don't want to throw off the tone mapping because all kinds of weird stuff can happen. So this could be a good opportunity to educate the client and um, you know just close the windows or close the blinds. And you can also point out to the client that when you do those types of things, um, you know there's less reflections on the TV and less glare and stuff like that. So there could be an opportunity there for an education. Um, so there's settings that you do want to stay away from uh, in HDR. We talked a little bit about brightness and contrast. Um, typically, the color and the tints are fixed as well. They're, they're tied back to the tone mapping and color volume. Uh, you typically don't want to mess with those. The things that you do want to do in HDR, you do want to get the luminance set correctly with either the backlight or the OLED light. You also want to white balance it. Uh, you know, we don't want bluish white. You don't, you don't want pinkish white or, or, God forbid, greenish white. Um, and then, you know, if the TV does have CMS controls in HDR, um, you know, if you're looking at the delta errors and the numbers are a little too high for your taste, you know, there's nothing wrong with going in and kind of tweaking the, uh, the CMS controls a little bit too. So let's take a quick look at some graphs on, um, on a TV that I worked on recently. Now, all I did to this TV was I picked a better picture mode than how it came from the factory. Uh, in this case, I think it was HDR cinema. And I did a two-point white balance on it. And that's all I did to the HDR mode. And look at some of the results that we got. Now, on the RGB balance graph, Ignore the fact that it dips and it comes back up. It only does that because of the EOTF. That's where the TV's tone mapping kicks in. But what we're looking at here and what's important, if you notice, it looks like one solid blue line. And we see that because uh, red, green, and blue are so smushed together, it looks like a solid line. This is great. This is a very, very good, good grayscale. And look how well the EOTF tracks now. And that's just by picking a better mode and doing a two-point white balance. Now, after we did that, um, we had a delta, uh, delta error on the grayscale of about a 1.3, which is excellent. And when we ran the color checker test, I had a delta error of about 1.5, which is also excellent. So just by picking the right mode and picking, uh, I'm sorry, doing the two-point grayscale, you can get some very, very excellent results out of the HDR. Now, how much time did this take? You know, by the time I got the meter set or the generator set up correctly and, um, and Calman set up correctly, you know, we're talking maybe 10 or 15 minutes to calibrate the, the HDR in this fashion. Could I have spent a little bit more time and, and got the EOTF a little bit better? Probably, you know, but you have to balance out like how much are you charging versus how much time are you, are you spending on it? Uh, but this, guys, this gave excellent results after just a few, uh, you know, just a few adjustments. Now, I, I, I put in the fourth bullet point for a reason. Just because the TV has a cinema mode or something like that, don't assume that's the right mode. 
take some measurements just just to be safe. Um, you know, it, when you're doing science, you don't guess things and you don't assume things. You always test. So especially if you're working with a TV that you've never worked with before, go through all the modes, look at the readings and see which one fits the fits the situation the best. We talked earlier about AutoCal. Now, this is great because instead of spending 20 or 30 minutes on a 20 point grayscale, you might be able to spend three minutes on this. This is going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Um, uh, you can do things AutoCal like the grayscale, uh, the gamma or the EOTF like we just looked at for HDR and, and things like color management. The brand new LG 2018 models, not just the OLEDs, but the full line are capable of AutoCal, which is cool. Um, with the 2017 Samsung QLED models and going forward, those also work with AutoCal. If you're doing AutoCal on a LG, um, the way that CalMan talks to the television is you could do it two ways. Um, if, you're, if your laptop that you're working on is on the same Wi-Fi network as the TV, you can send all your commands to the TV over Wi-Fi. If you don't have Wi-Fi in that situation or, or, or it stinks, you can take an Ethernet cable, plug it into your laptop, plug the other end of the TV, and you can communicate over IP on the LGs. Um, on the Samsung's, it's a little bit different. There's a couple of adapters I'm going to show you on the next slide. Uh, the first adapter is a USB to serial cable. The second adapter is a, three, a serial to 3.5 millimeter cable. At the end of the day, this is what you have when you couple those two adapters together. Um, you got a USB that plugs into the laptop on one end and a 3.5 millimeter on the other end. Now on the Samsung's, they come with that separate one connect box. That's where your connections go and sometimes even power. So that 3.5 millimeter plugs into the EX link on the one connect box. And now the CalMan program can talk to the TV directly. What's great about this guys, what, one of the things I love about it the most is that I no longer have to pick up the TV's remote and pull up the menu and go through and make adjustments. I can make all my adjustments in CalMan, which is awesome. What's also great about that, if any of you have experienced this before, with certain technologies, like projectors especially, if you're trying to measure something and you bring up a menu, that menu can pollute your readings. So all that's going away. We're able to talk directly to the TVs now. You don't even have to find the factory remote anymore. You can do it all in CalMan, which is awesome. All right, so a couple pro tips. Um, I mentioned this before, and this is really the, the truth to it. Calibrating HDR, uh, the hardest part about it is getting HDR to the display and setting up CalMan and the 6G correctly. The actual physical calibration part is, is a piece of cake. Now that we've now that we figured it out, um, if you are going to calibrate Dolby Visual Dolby <laughs> Dolby Vision on a 2018 uh, LG, you don't need anything extra. You don't need anything specific. But if you're still working on 2017 models, make sure you have in your backpack or your calibration kit a, a, an empty thumb drive. It doesn't have to be a, a huge capacity or anything like that. Once you calibrate Dolby Vision in Calman, you do have to transfer a file from from your laptop to the TV, and you do that with a thumb drive. Luckily, in the 2018 models, you don't have to do that anymore, so it's kind of a, a thing that's going away. But try to have a thumb drive on you anyway, because you never know, um, you know, if you need to do firmware updates manually, maybe the client doesn't have their Wi-Fi set up because it's a brand new home, or they just moved in, or whatever. Um, and also, too, if you have a thumb drive, it gives you an opportunity to put some some clips on there too to to show off your calibration. Not everybody has a Blu-ray player anymore, so you know you don't want to turn on some random cable channel because it might look terrible. So if you do have a thumb drive, I would highly recommend um, having some good clips on your thumb drive to show off the calibration. Uh, what I found so far on the LGs is there's two or three or actually actually four, I want to say four different modes for HDR on the LG. Uh, what I found so far is that Cinema is the most accurate one out of the box. They do have one called Cinema Home. Uh, it is a little bit brighter, which might work in a brighter environment such as a living room. But the problem is with Cinema Home, it doesn't quite have the fidelity. Uh, because it is a little bit brighter, it does blow out some of those uh, specular highlights and it does clip a little bit. Uh, but if you're in a brighter room, you might need it. Uh, but cinema so far has been been the most accurate mode out of the box. Um, <clears throat> Sony's Sony's are a little weird. They don't necessarily have like their own modes when the TV is in HDR. So what I've been doing with those is I might calibrate the standard dynamic range in custom and use Expert One as my color temperature, and then I might calibrate uh, like Cinema Pro or, or Cinema Home as my HDR mode and use like an expert two to adjust my grayscale. Uh, so just be careful with the Sony's. Uh, you may be calibrating multiple modes, no big deal, but it, it's it's something you have to worry about. Um, and we talked earlier about uh, big systems. What if you have a, a few devices, a receiver uh, and a TV, which one do you calibrate first? First, you should always plug in the generator directly to the TV. Calibrate the TV, okay? Now when the TV's dialed in and you're happy with it, now you can unplug your generator from the TV 
Now plug your generator into an input on the receiver and just look at some test patterns. Uh, look at black levels, look at white levels, maybe look at the gamma, maybe just take a quick check of the grayscale. Make sure that that receiver is not messing up the video signal because that could be a, that could be a big headache for a lot of people. This happened to me a lot back in the day uh, when receivers were just getting into HDMI switching. They didn't quite have a handle yet on HDMI signal, so they did some really weird stuff to the picture. Um, what I've seen in a lot of receivers lately is they'll have like a, a, a native setting or, or a pass-through setting. And you can usually find that in the output um, menu of the receiver where you set resolution and things like that. But what I've seen so far is if you put the receiver into a pass-through mode, the signal that comes into the receiver and the signal that goes out to the receiver is exactly the same. In other words, the receiver's passing the video signal through without touching it, which is really what we want. All right, and wrapping up. Um, I've said it before, I'll say it a million more times, I'm sure, but display calibration is not just about calibrating the display anymore. Uh, you know, you almost have to change what we do to system calibration. Um, we're wearing many different hats now. We have to know about infrastructure, we have to understand EDIDs, um, and we have to be able to work around um, you know, older legacy devices and older infrastructure. So system calibration is, is more important now than, than it's, it's the most important thing now. It's not just the TV. Uh, correct tools are more essential than ever. Um, you know, how are you going to calibrate a TV in HDR if you don't have a pattern generator that outputs HDR? So, you know, make sure that your tools are up to date. And if you're using a color emitter, you know, make sure you're doing your maintenance on it once a year or, or maybe once every 18 months, depending on how much it's being used. Um, if, you, if you do calibrate a TV that's out of spec, then your levels are all out of spec too. You're not, you're not hitting the correct targets because the meter was, had drifted over the years. Uh, look at analyzers like the Fox and Hound kit or the Meridio 6A. Those are really helpful for things like troubleshooting. Um, the SC1 that we looked at before, the little scaler and the, and the one by two HDMI splitter, those will help you in legacy systems where you have mixed resolutions and distributed systems and things like that. Uh, or if you have a really expensive you know, Macintosh AVR that can't pass 18 gigs, but it sounds amazing, you know, use one of those one by twos and just work the video around the around the receiver. Everything matters, guys, including your HDMI cables. Test your HDMI cables before you put them in. Make sure they can meet that 18 gig spec. And you're going to have a lot less headaches down the road. And guys, really, at the end of the day, um, this is just the stuff that we know about HDR so far. It's a very it's still a very kind of bizarro world. And it, it is still a bit of the wild, wild west. Uh, different manufacturers are doing things differently and, and the way that they set up their modes and settings and things like that. Um, you know, uh, what, what we strive to do at ISF and, and with AV Pro is, uh, you know, a lot of what we do is education. So um, if you haven't been there yet, go ahead and head over to meridio.com. And if you click on support at the top of the screen, um, we do have forums. Um, I've been dumping a lot of uh, a lot of this info into the forums as of late. Uh, so it's a good place for people to kind of meet up and communicate and, and share um, share things that they found in the field. And, you know, if you guys are out in the field and you find some new thing and, and it's working for you, feel free to share it because, you know, you might you might help, you know, you might help out some of your fellow calibrators uh, avoid some headaches and things like that. So knowledge is key here, guys. And it's always it's always moving. It's always evolving. So, you know, the way we're doing HDR now and calibrating it and handling it now, that's going to be different, you know, maybe even as, as little as a year from now. So keep in touch with us. We're going to do our best to keep this information flowing to you guys. Um, that's pretty much the end of the webinar. I'm sorry. I know I ran over just a few minutes, but um, it looks like there were some questions that came into the chat box. Um, I do want to get to those questions. So what I'll do is um, we do have a record of everybody's email address who's on the webinar, and I can see who asked these very specific questions. So I will answer those questions individually um, today or, or tomorrow at the latest. And um, you know, if some of the questions are very good, compelling questions, I'll throw those up on the Meridio forums as well. That way, everybody can um, everybody can see the uh, see the answer. So thanks again, guys. Uh, this is a lot of fun, and I look forward to more of these in the future. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and enjoy your weekends, and happy calibrating.